Okay, so I think we'll just start. We've added like four or five people. That's a significant uh, difference. That's has some big significant difference. Okay, so maybe just to introduce Ada, then I can hand over to her and she can take over. So Ada is a data scientist and a machine learning engineer. So she has experience in so many things. She's in biotech, she has done AI, she has done ed tech, she's also done uh, software companies and she mainly uses Python and R. So her keen interests are on research and just combining that with their engineering implementations so that she can develop products and create informative, decisive, and sustainable production workflows. So on top of that, uh, Ada is also one of our Ten Academy board member. And as I have seen, she's also a Batch 3 alumni. So currently, I think currently she is serving as a data scientist at um, Pivot, Pivot Bio. And uh, for those, if anything of what I've mentioned interests you, just make sure to ask her questions and uh, benefit, and you get benefit from this session. Okay, so over to you, Ada. All right, uh, thank you, Anna, for the intro. Uh, um, also, thank you to the to the Academy Batch 6 members and our staff team for sparing uh, an hour of your day today to just like listen to me rant and also have some QA session with you guys, so I really appreciate that. And um, I've prepared uh, seven paid slides. I'm planning on using tops half an hour and then like setting aside the, other, the remaining time for questions. So if we can have the moment I start sharing my screen, so if we can have someone just to no notify me when 30 minutes end from the mo moment I start sharing my screen, then that would be nice. So and uh, maybe you can do that for me. Um, okay, and uh, I will also be turning off my video because I will be presenting from a bigger screen. So I'm sure you don't wanna like view me from a weird angle or anything. And also just simply because I'm, I'm I think the only one with a video on. So, okay. Um, so, can you guys see my screen? Yes, you can see your screen. Okay, cool. So, um, the title of the slide is Success in the AI Industry. Uh, on contrary, actually, that's not entirely what I'll be focusing on on this talk today, but that's just one of the things that I'll zoom into. I decided to go with that because it suits us both just to have that as the headline. So, um, like I said, I have a seven page slide and those are different things that I'll be talking about or engaging you guys in today. And uh, moving on just straight forward to my introduction. I know Anna already introduced me formally, um, just maybe to tell you a bit more about my background before I start sharing. Um, what I have to share. So, uh, right, I am a machine learning engineer and data scientist with uh, a keen interest in research. And uh, basically, you cannot be a, a good researcher without having some experience in engineering. So that's why I am right now. I'm a machine learning engineer and a data scientist. And uh, in the middle column, I have a bunch of logos aligned for you guys, this is just like a summary of the edu my educational background. I did a bachelor's degree in mathematics and computer science at the Technical University of Mombasa, uh, which is located in Mombasa, which is also where I live, although currently I'm not in Mombasa. That's why I have a Marvin. Um, aside, uh, aside from my bachelor's degree, I've also done a bunch of uh, data science, domain knowledge, critical thinking, maybe a bit of investment, uh, short courses, and uh, data camp, Coursera, and IBM mainly form the basis of where I look for that kind of knowledge. Um, like Anna said as well, I am a Batch 3 graduate uh, back in 2020, and uh, I am also a Chen Academy board member is from uh, <coughs> Excuse me, 
is from uh, some time. I can't quite put a timestamp on that, but I have the honor of representing the, at least the from batch one up to now, the um, Chair Academy folks at the board. Um, on the right column uh, are the main companies that I am associated with. So I worked, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, I have a flu, so you'll be hearing uh, a lot of sneezing and coughing, so I'm sorry in advance. So I've served in ML research capacity at Traits AI, which is the AI domain that Anna was talking about. I have also served as a data scientist at Pivot Bio, and uh, a point of correction, I am no longer with Pivot Bio. I stopped around um, May, June. Right now, um, um, I actually had to step out of the job because I had, um, I wanted to zoom into a more ML engineering role and that was getting a bit more analytical. So, <coughs> so I'm no longer there. So right, right now I'm actually in the job hunting industry alongside freelancing and a bit of entrepreneurship that um, I've picked up along the way since I left uh, Ten Academy and college in general. Um, So, um, uh, okay, since we have the QA at the end of the presentation, I'm just gonna uh, let you guys, I'm going to let you guys like write down your questions on the side. So if you have anything along the, stri uh, the slides that I'll be sharing, you can just ask at the end. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about my experience at Ten Academy. And uh, just diving right into it, I'll start with my last point, which is the um, the intensive and the vigorous nature of the program. So um, I'm not sure what week you're at right now, but I bet maybe under five weeks. And uh, I can assume or like deduce that the transition that you're experiencing right now from like the comfortable environments that you are in before joining to academy to, <coughs> um, sorry, excuse me, to what you're dealing with right now. Um, I, I was there and uh, in, my, in my opinion, from my POV, it was intense and quite a transition for me. But that's not to say that my experience was ugly or uh, not some was ugly or something that I was not uh, looking forward to. It was actually great. And uh, what can you do with this intense nature of the program? Because uh, if we would have a discussion on that, we would have like, of course, we would have the pros and cons. But like, that's what you have. So what you, what can you do to get the most out of this experience and the most out of this um, sort of program that we have? So like I said, I'd assume you're like under five weeks right now, but already you have like some sort of data about yourself or like a routine that you already have, that you know that you follow or like you're most likely going to stick to using it during the program. So what I would advise at that point is like <clears throat> um, using that sort of data or that routine that you have to maximize all the times that you're, you're mainly active. And uh, <coughs> make the program work uh, to your advantage. So for instance, I know I'm a morning person and I know uh, around maybe 3 p.m. I start uh, maybe uh, getting less productive. So this knowledge and also the knowledge of the sort of projects that I'm dealing with at uh, Ten Academy and the, the metric set that I know that uh, I should aim my best to at least like hit those threshold set, then I know I can like organize my day into like from say six up to around two, I'll be doing purely 10 Academy stuff. And then after that, then I'll, I'll just take time to, I'll just catch a break. So um, that way 
with that awareness of when you work better and when you're feeling a bit sluggish that you can like maximize the time and the um and uh, your energy to focus on something that's really uh productive for you the other thing that made me felt uh that made me have a really good experience at ten academy batch three was the community that we had back then our community manager was called uh prosper tony um i don't know where he is right now but a very impressive person so maybe you can check him out later He's got like really impressive um achievements in terms of community building and um social skills and uh basically dealing with people and so <clears throat> I'm assuming you have those sort of uh, sessions also uh, at batch six. So I would encourage you guys to like, don't just ignore it and say that uh, this is wasting my time. I'd rather focus on getting the project done or um, and uh, meeting up with some folks or whatever else you have on your list. So this was really handy for me, especially in the capacity of uh, building my social skills. So uh, <clears throat> assuming we're having a, one of those community building sessions and uh, everyone is there, everyone uh, is like, uh, they've let their guard down and uh, just like talking from um, I'm your fellow programmer point of view or like um, your fellow African graduate point of view. And that way you have like, I mean, you have like an immense source of data just basically from how people interact, how the nonverbal and verbal cues that just like fly around from one person to the other. And with this sort of information and the social skills that you pick from that interaction, then uh, you can use it to know how you interact with your folks, how to ask for help from someone, how also to, to like offer help to someone who is stuck. And um, they might, this might sound like a cliche or like something that everyone just says, but community really is like at the at, uh, one of the cornerstones of um, any work or internship or bootcamp environment because it comes a point where like you're really at a low or like you don't see the sense of things, but by observing your colleagues, then you see like maybe, maybe you can view things the way Anna does or the way uh, Patrick does or someone else. And it's also like a really good chance to catch a break. We've just talked about how intense and vigorous the program can be. So uh, showing up to those events uh, can like give you a break. The other like really important thing about community is like, um, you're, you're offered like a, a free platform to showcase what you can do. A while ago, uh, the batch five mates were graduating and I saw this guy playing a guitar. And um, I, don't know, I, I don't know if that performance did anything to, to, to them or it was just like for fun, but you can imagine like his content has been posted on 10 Academy's YouTube and that already, right? There's like free views for them or like just the simple joy of like being able to show what you're really good at. Maybe you're like lagging in programming, but by doing that, it really like boosts your morale to like feel like you have a place in the in the program. Uh, the other thing is uh, still in the context of community, uh, finding your own uh, bunch of people that you easily interact with. So uh, this goes without saying, uh, not everyone can just like join a, a community or a group or a boot camp and like shine or be talkative or be easygoing like maybe some other people would be but, like finding your own people who you can spam with messages at night you can even like look for form or, or um, I'm thinking now for is more of a Kenyan term, but like uh, looking for fun things to do when you're not doing kind of academy stuff. That's really helpful. And just like cheering each other up when you're feeling like, oh my God, this week is so draining. And um, I feel like maybe I should stop or like just mark time until I feel like I'm back to my best. But having that group, it will like um, 
I don't know, motivate you, psych you up, help you when you stop. And it goes without saying, once you have like your clique where you're easy to like interact with, then it's easier to get help from within that group than having to source somewhere outside. And this is not to promote the sense, the, the sense of like groupings and stuff which would otherwise maybe in a long shot cause discrimination and stuff. That's not the goal here. Um, what I also found interesting in my experience at Ten Academy was the, the leaderboard. Um, again, I'm going with the assumption that you still use those nowadays. We also had the badges. We had the, the, the best at engineering, the best at presentation and whatnot. And once in a while we'd uh, take tasks from maybe Zindi or Kaggle that involved like leaderboards and stuff. So I don't know, but for me, this was really handy uh, in keeping me in check with uh, with the goals that I'd set. Uh, and also having that sense of competition, like Anna did better than me at this. Let me look at their work. How did they approach this and that? Having that sort of challenge will at least get you out of your comfort zone and make you like embrace what other people are doing and make you want to be seen. Because I tend to believe that everyone wants to be like seen as being the um, the greatest person in the bunch. And you can do that. You just have to like find the right sources of motivation and put in the work. So just to summarize the slide, my experience at Ten Academy was. Um, I can't quite put one word to it, but at the very least, it was interesting. It was, it made me grow in a lot of aspects of life, technically, socially, uh, mentally, and even, uh, I don't know the term for networkingly, but that was also like, really handy. Um, um, so if you have questions regarding this slide, you can just like jot them down and I can get back to them later. Moving on, um, uh, the life after graduating from Ten Academy. So I can, I think we can all agree that this is like the, the phase that we're really looking forward to. And I can also say out of experience, this is like the, one of the most challenging phases. We have the, now I'm done. I am very confident that I have skills that can land me a job on top of the very nice education degree that I have. Now I need to get a job. I've applied to 150 job applications. Maybe 30% of them, I, I managed to get up to like the third phase, but that's the farthest I got. And then the rest, I didn't get responses. I, I'm, I'm saying this not to be negative, but because uh, this is what you actually, at least most of you, statistically at least, will experience after after being done with Gen Academy. Uh, so we have that, and then maybe you decide uh, I'm going to do a bit of freelancing so I can pay my rent or so I can stop living with my parents or so I can just have some extra cash to party or maybe to invest depending on what goals you have in terms of where you need money. So maybe you decide to move in that direction while you sort out things with your job applications. Or maybe you, or not maybe, but in the long run, you actually got a job at the end. So there are those three phases and uh, they all have their challenges. There are um, quite a bit, uh, a few points that I can speak to, the, to those uh, sections. So regarding job applications, like I said, uh, it can be really hectic. You can apply 100 jobs and only get like responses from 10 of them. And out of the 10, maybe five are rejections and five is uh, what you can work with. So um, one thing I've learned in the process and that I'm still learning about right now, because like I said, I'm still in that window right now since I uh, since my last job uh, and also something that I've learned from Arun and other peers that I've met sorry not peers but like leaders and mentors and managers that I've met along the way is uh, building your profile 
And this, this applies both to the freelancing bit and to the job applications bit. So um, one thing about uh, employers or HR managers is they have a very specific uh, niche or group of qualifications and skills that they want to fetch from a pool of over a thousand candidates. And they want to make that, um, they want to make that process as simple, as smooth, as accurate and productive as possible. And then there's you, you feel like, not you feel like, but you are actually qualified. You've done a bunch of projects, you've done a bunch of internships, and at least you've got something to say for yourself. But you're not alone, like right now, say you're but six, uh, I don't know, say you're 50 and you're all applying to the same job. So how do you stand out? So one thing I picked along the way is um, customization. Every job application, every freelancing profile needs to have its own uh, customized profile because um, at the end of the day, in as much as you want to get the job, um, you'll be doing the job for a company and you need to, to deliver what the company needs. So you need to show them that you can do what they actually request or like or need from you. That's where stuff like job description and requirements come in really handy. So don't go around just like throwing random or average. Huh? What's the what's the like non mathematical equivalent of average? Cliche? No, no cliches. To cliches are being correct, but don't go around using one CV for a bunch of job applications you need to give them you need to show them what you what you have to hope to offer that will directly or somehow indirectly solve or fill the gap that they're looking to fill uh to fill yeah the other the other um, phase that's a bit challenging not really challenging but the moment you get into the interviews and assessments phase it's it's really a matter of these guys believe in me, they saw my CV and they think that uh, I'm good enough. So what's remaining is just like showing them that they didn't make a mistake. So uh, for this, uh, some key things I would mention is uh, preparation in terms of technical skills and also soft skills. And uh, one, one bonus point along the way, the thing about uh, community and people interaction and uh, awareness and uh, uh, the ability of using the data that's directly in front of you to uh, to your advantage. This also comes in handy at this point because um, say I have three interviewers, one, one smiling, maybe one smiles a lot, the other one is just uh, maybe too professional. With this information already in collaboration with your soft skills and whatever you had prepared for that interview, you can customize just on top of your head, nothing too fancy or organized, but you can you can like answer subconsciously like, this, this guy is a bit friendly, I'm gonna be a bit friendly with him or her them as well and this one's about uh, a bit too professional maybe should i throw in a word like sa or um i'm not saying go around calling people sa in interviews but like that ability of processing what you see subconsciously and just like visually the the minute you're in there and in conjunction with your preparation to put it to your advantage is uh it's really, it's really um, a 10 pointer when having interviews and uh, a slide point in regards to salary neg negotiations. Um, a bit of a sensitive topic here, but uh, we're all from Africa and we're used to, uh, uh, I'm going to use a blunt word over here, underpaid. I could, I know I could think of something better, but uh, we're used to, accepting the bare minimum but that's I, I mean with time and with experience and just with interaction with people from different walks of life you come to realize that uh there's no advantage to underselling yourself 
So uh, if you've gone to the moon and back, then say it in your interview. If you want 100K per year, then say it. Um, so at this point, what you need to know is what the market has to offer versus what you need and how much you can go or how what kind of balance you can uh, you can have with those two. Um, so uh, don't undersell yourself. Uh, don't settle where don't settle where your goals or like what you had in your list hasn't been met. Because at the end of the day, you'll pick it. Maybe it will work, work out for you. That That's really good. I wish that forever. But uh, in the long run, maybe when things get a bit tough, then you'll start like feeling uh, resentful. Like, I wish I didn't pick this up. I wish uh, I could speak out for myself because now it's not even worth the struggle. So just uh, don't undersell yourself. Don't accept what's below the bare minimum. And uh, <coughs> uh, when you're at the juncture while you're dealing with uh, freelancing, I'm, I'm quite confident that you guys are aware of platforms like uh, freelancer.com, um, Upwork, uh, Teacher On. There's a bunch of uh, different freelancing uh, sites out there. So, and one of the common things in the freelancing world alongside building your profile to stand out as impressive and as the right person for whatever project is writing your proposal to get a, to get a job assigned to you or a project or a task. Uh, I picked this quote from Apoc and I'll just read it verbatim. There may be no better way to prove to clients that you can succeed at their project than showing them an example of something similar you've already done. So be it, uh, be it you have a, a project that you've done in a similar context, be it that uh, you've utilized such skills but in a different context, or be it you've actually done uh, at least 80% similar to what the client wants to, to, to get done. Um, the key here is uh, you're not really what matters here, but what matters is what can you do, deliver in line with what the client wants and do you have proof of that? So that's a key takeaway that I've learned in my freelancing world that uh, alongside having an impressive profile, what do you have to offer that's really specific to what the client needs? It all goes back to the to the issue of customization. So um, yeah, yeah, that's something really worth noting. And once you're successful at this phase and you get the project, then make sure that your delivery is timely, uh, your code is maybe extensible, it's reliable, it does everything that was expected of you. And uh, this this is all for safeguarding your, your rating or like, um retention of this particular client because believe it or not the first few clients that you're able to like pocket when you're getting into freelancing are the same guys that will like stick or sting you along string you along the whole process right now like i said i'm back in freelancing and the very same folks that i was working with back when i landed my first job are among the folks that i work with right now and i wouldn't say that and I would say that if I hadn't done the project uh, correctly or if I had failed somewhere, then I wouldn't have that chance and I'd probably be stuck writing proposals, which, which we all also know that is a really tedious phase. And uh, talking about work life, uh, once the job application has gone through, you've received an offer, I'm going to talk about um, the challenges, and I'm, I'm only going to talk about one, the imposter syndrome, which is something that I personally experienced when I started my job at Pivot Bio. And um, one thing I can say for this is uh, at least everyone gets it. A big percentage of the population gets it. And like I've quoted down, there is a soccer fan 
actually not soccer, football. I quite feel uh, it's offensive to call football soccer because they don't really have a thing for uh, American football. So yeah, you don't need to be the GOAT during game week one. You need, you need time. You need time to learn your team. You need time to learn your formation. You need time to learn your strategy. Are we playing attack, attacking or are we playing defensive? So this is something that most of you are going to experience. Not that I'm wishing on you guys, but just know that it's actually normal. And um, as shown in this orange, brownish image with a blue and yellow circle, um, what you actually think that uh, you lack or what you actually think that your colleagues have that you don't have is really all in your head. Yes, they might have it, but you have something else to offer. Yes, uh, I've joined a new organization. I'm a machine learning engineer. They have like very good mastery of the algorithms and the, and the mathematics behind it. But I'm new, what I have is mainly applications. So you see right there, right there, they have, on their end, they have the, the domain knowledge, okay, not the domain knowledge, but the, the algorithm mastery. But when you're end, you know what's, what's on top of the market right now. You know the main applications, and you also know uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of whatever they're working with. So it's not really a matter of comparison, and it's not a matter of fitting in 100% day one, but it's a matter of learning your position adapting and uh, just fitting in based on the flow and then making your mark in your own way while also celebrating the marks made by your older colleagues who at some point at the start intimidated you. So yeah, the other thing that I'd like to reflect on is uh, most of us in the, in, the, in the tech world, I don't wanna just say in the data world because uh, we have software engineers and whatnot. Most of our roles are actually remote and uh, believe it or not, in as much as most people like it or like praise it for some reason or like, I don't know, just prefer it to the old school nine to five physically in an office, uh, sorry, office work fashion. It also has its challenges. And again, I speak this out of challenge. So, Sorry, I speak this out of experience, not challenge. But yeah, it was a bit of a challenge, especially if you, if you don't have people around you. You really need to find a way to, to balance the hours you spend at work and the hours you spend catching up with your mates or just like having normal work events. Because um, in as much as there's value in your work, in as much as there's reward, which is either good money or, hey, big up from your manager, there's also that sense of fulfillment. Like, I also exist physically. I'm not trying to draw a philosophical lesson here, but like, I also exist here physically and I see people in my life either daily or weekly, depending on the frequency that you go out. and there's some prime or, or subconscious need to like be able to bond or interact with those people. So don't throw it away in the name of my work is my world because it will always catch up with you. And the moment you have a work routine and things get a bit normal, then suddenly they get a bit boring. Then that's when you start to feel like, what else do I have to say from, um, for what I am or for what I'm doing apart from work. And uh, lastly, once you guys get job. Hey, be added just to cut you short. It's been 30 minutes. Wow. You want to know it was 30 minutes, so maybe I don't know how you can proceed. You want to wrap up or maybe, yeah, it's just it's been 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, okay. Give me, give me actually 15 minutes. Now you find me again in 15 minutes and then I think I'll be done. Sure, sure, that's, that's, that's okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, like I was saying, while working and like getting those fat rewards, always save and invest because, I don't know, 
you never know, maybe one day you'll get tired of walking or you just want to get some extra cash along the way. So yeah, there's, there's Bitcoin mining, there's crypto, there's, some, there's SMEs, there's so many things, there's shares and stuff. Just like look for the business people in your lives and drain them information because they're so very resourceful. Okay, quickly on this slide on time and stress management, um, starting with time, I tend to think time and discipline are very highly co correlated because, well, time will always be there, not like available for you to do stuff with, but like it will never change. You, I mean, you will always wake up in the morning and mornings will always be like 6 or 9 depending on your program and evenings will always be 6 or 9 p.m depending on your program. So what I would emphasize on is um, stressing on discipline. And some of the practices that I would encourage in terms of time, time management is uh, setting up goals, whether long-term, like yearly, monthly, or weekly, or short-term, daily, monthly, uh, sorry, not monthly, daily, or hourly, or by hour, whatever strategy that you use. and along the way also set um rewards and p penalties for like once i achieve this goal then i get i get this reward once i fail this goal then i get this penalty and um the human mind is like a like a dog uh, not in an offensive kind of way but the way you appreciate your dog and teach it discipline the better it serves you so again, with your brain, the more the more you teach it discipline and the more you reward it for like achieving those goals that you so much strain to, to attain, then that, um, the, that itself is a sort of motivation. There's also a bunch of tools out there like uh, Trello, Asana. Personally, I use uh, Google Calendar and, uh, and an accountability tracker created by Excel. So if you need like a template for the accountability tracker, just hit me up and uh adoption of our time management system that uh that will keep you in check this is work time this is rest time that way uh chances of getting uh, exhausted or burnout kind of go low so you need to know your routine you need to set your goals and you need to know your yeah routine slash habit and that way you can optimize now using the data that you have about yourself to make the best out of it. Um, um, the other key thing I'd like to talk about that is um, creating milestones while working. You should be aware of the something called the perfectionist trap. You have a project, you're supposed to build something. Don't wait until you're done to ask for feedback. Maybe divide it into three deliverables and at the end of each get feedback. And then that way you can do like incremental prototyping or incremental improvement. Um, the other one is on stress management, which also go hand in hand with time. And um, again, I would say the main, the main answer for this is time management and setting up your goals. Cause we all know that stress arises from stuff like heavy workload, having conflicts with your colleagues or, um, not hitting deadlines and so everyone is on your neck because your boss is also waiting but your boss's boss is also waiting for your boss to like give them feedback or something so it all goes down to planning and you only plan when you have good knowledge of how you work so what does your routine look like and also you plan this alongside um, maybe the time zone difference that you might experience along the way uh the other thing is back to the work-life balance, be strict on that because if you work too much and don't take time to, to like chill and take a, take a break, then I mean, the, the most probable end game is burnout. Uh, right, my second last um, slide, which, which happens also to be the title of my collection of slides, Success in the AI Industry. From my understanding, you guys are studying ML engineering, data engineering, Web3, those three, I'm quite sure of. And all this 
either directly or indirectly are related to AI, which is also my field of my field of career. So, and we can all agree on how it's so dynamic that tomorrow you could wake up that MLOps is actually uh, at the center of AI because we have ML engineers, we have data scientists, we have data engineers, but we don't have people for CICD or like that whole workflow smoothening up. You could also wake up that, like right now, I mean, I was catching up with NLP and back then TFIDF was like the holy grail of NLP. But like right now we've upgraded to RNNs, but RNNs are not even like at the top of the show right now. Right now we're talking about transformers and I might be wrong because maybe someone yesterday woke up with a research paper that's an improvement of a transformer. So you have to be aggressive and daily skilling up in order to be at par with what's going on in the AI industry. And by skilling up, there's the technical aspect of it, what's going in the software engineering world, what's going on in ML, what new models or, or algorithms do we have? There's also the, the, the math base. I know people hate studying math. I personally don't like skill up math wise a lot, maybe project wise, but maybe uh, a new algorithm is on the rise then it will take me back to my maths lesson so I could make sure that I have a good understanding of this algorithm. There's also critical thinking, which even if I have technical skills or soft skills or, um, or all the tools that I need to get this right, then I cannot make a sane or important conclusion of, of my work, my product or my analysis because, uh, because of critical thinking. I have the data, but I can't make sense of it. And this goes hand in hand with domain knowledge. So not to say that go around re reading about FinTech, about biotech and AI all at once, but whenever you're in a setup, other than the normal technical and soft skills and the tools that you need to be aware of, make that extra mile of getting some information about that domain that you are applying this data for because that will also point you in the right direction in terms of critical thinking and making decisions. Also, um, you need to showcase your work, be it uh, building a, a, a portfolio, a website, be it uh, writing blogs, be it taking part in open source projects. And don't get me started on, on the importance of open source projects because I can only assume that you know the value within contributing to open source. Uh, so there's also the communities like Kaggle and uh, the Guards. You have to showcase your work. Like I said, there's about 50 or 60 of you right now and you're all going into the same job market and you want to get the, the same high-end jobs. So how else are you going to get that if you don't showcase what you have? Because I need to see what you're made of so I can trust that you can deliver what I want. The other thing is don't just do ML and data engineering, also zoom into other AI branches like chatbots, um, maybe applications of AI in Web3, maybe conversational AI. There's so many applications of AI. So if you're free, if you have the time, if you're in the setup or if your work context allows you to, then get all that along the way because one way or the other you'll need it or it will boost your understanding of the whole AI industry. And finally, um, working in a diverse workplace. This I will summarize down to one point, consciousness. I mean, everyone talks about awareness. I'm using awareness as a synonym of consciousness. I mean, back to religious people like Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, meditation folks like Sam Harris, and basically your manager. They all want you to be aware so you can have a successful experience with your, with your workmates in a case where it doesn't even have to be in a diverse workplace because at the ground of human interaction is understanding and uh, compassion. And this comes out of uh, consciousness. If you're aware of your environment, I'm in a work setup, then I'll be professional. I'm in a social call, then I'll be a bit chatty and smiley. 
if you are aware of the difference in opinions, I am um, maybe I'm Muslim and you're Christian, and you don't and uh, you don't like me. Uh, I don't know talking a lot about uh, maybe there's just some insensitive topic. If I am aware that you don't do well or like you don't tolerate that, then I can I can react accordingly. So the very first thing is being conscious of the people around you. And then that way you can reflect, uh, I mean, you can offer professionalism, sensitivity and respect, and in turn, get all those back. And when this happens, of course, you have your soft skills up your sleeve. And um, basically you have a smooth interaction or work environment. Uh, there's always gonna be challenges where people are not sensitive or people are just like, uh, hard headed or not, sorry, not that people are just, uh, selfish or they're just too self-centered. So again, uh, that's quite a tricky question, actually, in a setup where you're the conscious one and your folks are the, actually the non-conscious or like the self-centered ones, then I guess really it's, it's matter of a question of social social um i mean it's not really a programming domain but what i can advise is at the center of human interactions is consciousness just be aware of how you interact with people and there's a high chance it will be reflected back to you and don't don't be too scared if maybe you're from a minority group there's this um stereotype that software engineers just like code at night wear hoodies and uh, just don't talk to people. Just go beyond those stereotypes and just be you. You don't have to be like, just be you, be aware and be respectful of whoever is around you. Um, I believe that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. Yeah. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sorry. Thank you. I was, I was just going to say thank you for that very detailed uh, presentation. I see some questions already started on the on the chats. Maybe we could go with those as we wait for others to just raise their hand. I think I think from now on we can just take. Uh, Anna, can I actually ask for a minute break? One, just oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, so guys, maybe just reaction, not questions, a reaction. I hope the answers are some form of reaction as we give Adam some few minutes break. And then it's a nut Nile, you have something to react to before before asking a question. And then it. Uh, yeah, it was a very nice presentation and it's so inspiring. I mean, uh, to uh, hear a testimonial from uh, and Munai of Ten Academy just uh, gives us the, the, I mean, the affirmation of like, we are in the right place uh, to be, uh, I mean, to grow and to have a very successful future. So it's so inspiring to hear your story, to hear your experiences. And I've taken a lot of notes from your presentation. It, it was a very nice presentation. That's what I want to say. I will get back to my question when I'm allowed. Uh, thank you, uh, Alexander. Thank you. It's very kind of you. So uh, the first question I see is from Fiseha. Thank you very much. I think experience sharing is very fun. By far the best way to learn from someone. So one question I have is what do you think is the most important skill or skills, both soft and technical, that is very essential to land a job? So, so um, Fiseha, do, do you want, uh, just, just to be clear, to reflect back on your question, do you want me to talk about detailed skills both in the soft and technical angles or um could you would you uh do you mind like asking that again oh, okay uh 
we really need to uh, have detailed uh, kind of, uh, but since I'm not the only one who has questions, uh, I think it would be better for all of us if you can just highlight some of the, you know, very important, like the top five or top three things, both in the soft and technical parts that we actually need to focus on, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, yeah, it does. So I'm going to start with the soft skills. So first of all, I, I, I'll start with that whole bit about awareness. So I know awareness is a bit of an abstract or a vague word to use as an adjective, but understanding your environment, be it in a team stand-up, be it in a work presentation, be it in a, a job interview, you need to have that skill of being able to summarize your audience or the people that you are in together within that in that setup or meeting or environment. Once at least you have a, a basic understanding of, of the kind of people that you're dealing with, and this can be even just professional qualifications, social qualifications, and this is completely based on your judgment, at least on the social angle. Once you have that, then the other skill I would mention is um, being able to translate non-technical, I'm sorry, being able to translate technical stuff to, to layman language. Not everyone knows the AI jargons. And so um, if, you can, if you can do that kind of delivery without leaving out the most important points of whatever you have to present, then I would find that to be really handy in, um, in the work environment. Moving on to the technical skills, I'm not going to talk about all the, you should be good at Python, good at Java, R, or whatever tech stack that you need or you should have. But first of all, you should be good at adapting. So you're in this company, everyone uses a Mac or everyone uses a window and, uh, sorry, Windows, and there you are, your Linux person. So first of all, you need to be able to adapt could it could be a as simply as your development working environment or as simple as I'm used to presenting in Google Slides, but they're using a uh, Microsoft SharePoint. So you, you need to be that flexible. It could be as easy as that or as complex as I'm used to using S3, but over here they're using Kubernetes. And um, just by earning the title ML engineer or data scientist or data engineer in, in this domain, in this side of the world that we work in, then enough has to be said about uh, this person has a really impressive profile or like they're really smart because getting here is not a joke. So ad adaptation goes hand in hand with your intellectual cap capability in which I believe that at this point, if we're all here, that at least we pass the bare minimum required for us to be able to adapt in those situations. And then also one really ad admirable thing is being able to um, skill up. I mean, the moment you're in this work environment and you know people are dealing with robots over here rather than uh, financial statements that you're used to, then you need to be able to as quickly and comfortably and uh, optimal as possible, catch up or fill that difference gap between what, between what you have.
Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I had a bit of a net disruption. Disruption. So, I, I, the, the other question that was in my mind was from Mar Margaret Chakiri, who I'd also like to throw a just uh, uh anyway i went to high school with her so nice to see you over here maggie and uh if you could paste back again your your question because i had to leave the meeting and join and any any other person who texted after maggie hi Ada. it's nice to see you here mm -hmm. and my question was about how to balance um work and sleep Okay, so, oh, and um, just something that I think is really worth mentioning. When I was touching my job at Pivot Bio as a data scientist, we were dealing with all sorts of geospatial stuff, and I would reach out to Maggie, and she helped out a lot. So, big up from this side of the world. Uh, so, balancing work and sleep. Um, all right. Uh, for me, it all goes back to the to the point about knowing your routine and uh, organizing your day. If I know I I sleep a lot during the day, or if if I am aware of my routine, I am an early riser or like a late sleeper. Then that way, I I don't have to like force myself or conform myself into some sort of uh, a planning that everyone uses. I know you have your deadlines and stuff, but you can work with what you best, with how you best operate to deliver what is expected of you. So just check your, your routine and then bring into play something like the Pomodoro time management technique and also bring into play your goals and then just allocate those. D don't force anything, Amma, or sorry, not Amma, that's Swahili. Don't force anything if, if it's not adding up for you, but also don't don't like give room for um, laziness. Try at least to get out of your comfort zone. But at the base of it, what's your routine and how do you work well? Does that answer your question, Maggie? You actually, um, call her Chippy. Yeah, I I still call me Chippy. Um, my question was more about um. So since the program is a bit intense and mm -hmm. uh, you need to put in like extra hours to um, to just get a bit more knowledge and more information. So mm -hmm. what exactly is the limit for you to like, like really squeeze your sleep time and also balance work at the same time? Okay, uh, how much can you sacrifice? But that's that's rhetorical. Uh, so we're in an intense program where my normal working hours don't work out for me, and I have to like step into my chilling hours uh, to get what I need to get done done. So how much can I compromise? How much do I need this program? And uh, what do I have to lose if I take this one hour of sleep and put it into work? And is there any sense of value in this one hour that I'm transferring from my chill time to my actively working hours? So you, I would maybe recommend doing like a pros versus cons list. Uh, I'm going to take this time to work. Uh, for this one hour, I'll achieve this and that. But also, I'll be I'll probably be a bit slow. So maybe I'll just exhaust all the pros and all the cons and just like wait, which one do I have to to gain more from? And at the end, there's this phrase about the end justifies the means. I'm not entirely agreeing with it, but at some cases you have to pull that card. I am suffering right now. Suffering is a big word, but I am going beyond my normal routine right now so i can have a bigger fish at the end of the day so is this is this fish important to you more than having a 
chilling, worthwhile, uh, healthy, or whatever adjective you want to describe, is it better than just using my time for my normal routine stuff? Okay, um, thanks. Um, can I ask my second question? Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, so um, since, okay, how easy or hard is it for someone who does not have a programming background to break into tech? For example, I did geospatial, but now it's like pivoting to data mm -hmm. and ML. So when you're applying for jobs, I think they might see that you just have um, data engineering skills for like three months. Um, mm -hmm. What's the best way to pivot in terms of your career choice? Um, right. um, no, that's it. Thanks. Uh, okay, okay. Anna, do you want to lend a hand in this? I mean, I know I can hold you accountable because at least I know you. Anna? Or anyone, does anyone wants to take a shot at this before I can offer my opinion? Or anyone in that, in the same context as, as Maggie coming from a background that's not tech and then having to like transform into tech? All right. Um, I'll take a Mm. Mele Mele not Neil Malesi. Do you want to try? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a, a quick question, uh, like a few of them actually. Can I ask or should I wait? Is this is this in regards to the the Margaret question? No, no. I I just have a, a question for you. Okay, okay, just keep that in mind. Let's, let's, let's see. Uh, and then it's Alexandra. Did you want to try the, the Maggie question? No, I just uh, raised my hand to ask you, actually. Okay, uh, I guess you. Anna, can anyone hear Anna? She's actually typing in the chat box. I personally cannot hear her. Uh, okay, Anna, Anna, I personally cannot hear you and the other folks are also saying that they can't hear you, so. All right, so Maggie, back to your question. I honestly could not uh, answer that to a fulfilling standard because I'm from a tech background, so I don't know what this means for you, but, um, one thing I know about uh, profiling in job applications is uh, not everyone will always uh, come come like come at your profile looking at what's your educational background and stuff. You can at least you can count on in the tech world. It's more about what you have to show for yourself and less about what you have achieved historically. In this context, your your spatial knowledge would would serve as a domain knowledge. So if I am a rec recruiter and also based on a few or like my experience with HR and, and recruiters in general, then in the tech world, it's really a matter of what you have to show for yourself. And this implies projects, boot camps, open source projects. What does your GitHub look like? What does your Medium look like? What does your LinkedIn look like? This is not to throw away the uh, completely the other aspect that um, this person sees you as a geospatial engineer and not as a programmer. But uh, it's it really comes down to what you can show for yourself. And this is not 100%. Because also, if you look at most of those applic job job applications, say ML engineer or data scientist and data engineer, they normally say we need a background in 
a, a technical bachelor's degree. They don't just directly say, I need uh, someone with a degree in computer science or someone with a degree in IT or something. So it's true that might serve as a bit of a disadvantage for you, but what you can do is optimize what you have under control. So what can you show for yourself on the computer science and programming side, aside from the very good knowledge have that you have in geospatial science? So does that answer you in any way? Um, yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, may I guess we're past time, but we can we can like extend with five minutes. I can take the question from Melesi and um, Alexander. Do you want to start, Melesi? Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Since we don't have time, I will ask uh, only two questions. Uh, I, I, mm -hmm. I had uh, a few. So. Uh, Mm, at the initial of the presentation of the, this meet, uh, Anastasia uh, explains that uh, you were interested in the research part. So I, I want to know why, why, what is the reason behind that? And also my next question will be, uh, what mm -hmm. is the required mass from those of us who, who would like to join the research industry and academia too? For example, like doing postdoc, doc, masters, uh, what, are, what is expected from us, actually? Well, and what do you suggest to those of us who want to, when, who want to go to research? Uh, yeah, these, these are my questions. Okay, so why am I interested in research? This is completely a, a passion thing. I Initially, I wanted to be an architect. I never really had passion in computer science stuff and just programming in general, but um, I couldn't really pursue what I really wanted, but what I liked the most next was math. And so um, machine learning or just any role in the data or AI domain in an engineering position doesn't really make you the chance to like to completely or like at least at, the, at a big percentage embrace the beauty of math. So for me, it's completely out of passion for math. So, and the, the best way forward that I've seen will work out for me that I can use math more and embrace math more in my day-to-day -day life is by zooming into research. Because in ML research is where you find that algorithms are being born algorithms are being improved and algorithms are being tuned to get the, the most accurate models. So it's a matter of passion and a matter of the best available uh, career path for me. And um, just also the glory of being able to be a part of the, to be a, a part of the group that gets to unleash uh, state of the art machine learning models. So there's also a bit of ego in there. So I hope that answers that. And also to get to, to, to the research level. So I'll start with the challenge. Uh, you don't really get a lot of machine learning research positions or AI research positions without a master's or a PhD, because at the bare minimum, they expect you to be an academic or academician, whichever the right English word is. So um, not, not to, to like reduce your hopes, but you should always go to that world with that expectation that I have my degree. So I have to like take a very big extra mile, be it getting experience or taking a certified online courses to show that I can I can reach up to that level to be considered a researcher. Um, what is expected? The nature of work that you need to do in order to be considered more of a researcher is different from what you need to do in order to be considered an engineer. An engineer will do a simple project on using the planning to identify which chest x-rays has cancer or not. And on this other end is 
which the planning model can I accurately or um, can which model can optimally deliver the results, the bare minimum results that I need for this particular chest X-ray project. So you also have to distinguish between the projects that you do. A simple example is like um, implementation of research papers. Research is a bit hard, by the way, at least in my opinion, because with engineering, you can use what's already been established. Those papers, those papers with code that's available there. But with research, you also, you have to like go to the law level, pick up the research that, that's out there, maybe try to implement it on your own and also trying to improve it on your own. So maybe just try to linger more on the research research-based projects and less, less on the engineering-based projects. Because other than, again, what you can show for yourself, you need the education. And at this level, we're all just bachelor's degree graduates. So there's that gap that you clearly need to fill. I hope that answers your question, Alessi. And um, does it? Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you. Okay, and you, you can also research more in um, research-based ML projects or AI projects. And lastly, moving on to Alexander and the next. Okay, uh, so uh, my question is, you've been into regular full-time job and uh, in a freelancing route. So uh, what do you prefer to go for in the future and which suits you the most? And uh, uh, which gave you uh, a good financial stability. Okay, uh, which fits me most, which I prefer, and finance stability. Uh, I'll start with the money issue here. Um, based on my experience, a full-time role has a more stable source of finance, but a freelancing role has random highs and lows. So today you could be working on a $500 project, tomorrow you could be working on a $20 project. So in terms of stability, I'd go for a full-time role. Which do I prefer? Um, I honestly can't answer that because I can say full-time and give it its advantages like the very first one, financial stability, a smooth career growth, a chance of networking, uh, a place for yourself. Um, I mean, where you can showcase yourself and you can stand out and be hard. There's all that, but also on the freelancing end, there's that flexibility on um, the very big challenge of time zone difference. Like when I was working at Pivot, I had like at least eight hour difference and my, ca my calls would run up to around 10 p.m. at night and you'd find that my social life is shit. Sorry for cussing. Uh, my social life is a bit suffering because you'd find that the time that I should be spending catching up with people around me, I'm just using it for work. So you see, to some point, if you value so much having that balance, then freelance is a bit good for you. So just peak just pick your main goal, your main um, definition of success, and then define those in the freelance column and also in the full-time column and see which works for you. But there's also that uh, one last advantage that I'll talk about, um, your, your, your profile, your CV. If maybe comes a time that you're tired with freelancing and maybe Alexander, you have like three years freelance experience, but uh, Asefa maybe has three years work time experience, maybe in two companies, then as a HR, then I think I'd be compelled to go along with the guy with the full time experience. So just check your main target, compare those two, and also the, um, the side effects of whichever you work with. And I also tend to believe that all of us, not all of us, at least the greater percentage of us want to like have that personal experience of being in a full-time role, at least for the fulfillment of I have a job, 
which is basically a big percentage of why you've been studying as an African, at least for the least. So that's really up to you, Alexander. Okay, I have a follow up question, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, so have you ever considered in uh, going in entrepreneurial road uh, route and uh, with, and the other question is, uh, in terms of growth, I mean, uh, uh, broadening your knowledge and challenges, uh, which like freelancing or full-time job, uh, which one like f fulfill your, I mean, uh, thirst for growing and knowing, experimenting a lot of stuff? Uh, still in the business context, yeah? Yes. Uh... Could you actually, do you mind like actually repeating that for me? Not, not in a business context, I'm sorry. Uh, in uh, knowledge, I mean, in uh, knowing different tools, technologies, and uh, working with uh, different things. So uh, mm -hmm. which one like uh, give you, I mean, wh where do you feel uh, you learn the most? Uh, if you get what I mean. Okay. Um, in terms of growth and learning then i feel like freelancing is a bit better for that because you get to work with a variety of projects all the way from nlb to deep learning to simple data science analytics but with a full-time job as much as you have that variety of projects that you're working on it's mainly under one umbrella one domain so yeah you grow but you grow specifically in one domain that um does that address it alexander yeah 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 definitely thank you okay uh so i'm gonna turn my video back on um i don't know if anna is back i don't know anna if you can hear us or if we have any other academy staff so we can call off the meeting but we have a good group rep representative okay so i'm back i don't know if you can hear me now Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. So I also had a question, maybe just to wrap up for, I think, maybe for this agenda. So at the beginning, you did mention that you shifted from Pivot Bio just uh, because it was getting more analytical and you wanted to do some uh, more of machine learning. So it got me thinking, even to some of the others here, how do you maybe prepare for such a shift just from like, okay, I was earning I was earning maybe this much from this company, and but it's not in my interest. So at what point do you just get over the fear of maybe I won't get something else in an year or two years and just do what, should I say, what your career, what your career path looks like for you? So is, it some, is there some kind of preparation you did or just how did you approach it? Because I know I think there are some here who are still working at the same time they're trying to do this, they're trying to do this program. So I don't know what can make you just believe in yourself and focus on one career path? All right, so first of all, you never, you never completely transition from earning this sum of money to earning nothing. You never really get over that. At least I'm not over that still yet. I, I mean, I'm still, I'm still in mourning, if anything. But um, I mean, the series of decisions that made me arrive at that one main, main big decision was <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, um, for me, it was really like, how am I feeling at this job? So, I mean, you're working daily, you have your routine, you have your normal stuff, but you feel like, um, I don't know, this is not quite what I signed up for, or if it is, then I am changing and I need something else. So for me, it was at that point when I felt like I needed a change. And then now I had to address what that kind of change, what kind of impact that sort of change had on my life. So um, it's not easy. There's no way you can know that I'll start as a data scientist and I know that I want to finish or retire as a data scientist. There's no solid way that I can tell you of that. 
maybe if you just like have a really really deep passion for what what you've set your mind to at that moment but just remember it's bound to change and when that point comes you don't have to ignore it because it doesn't serve you well. You have to listen to it and then again, wait, what does this actually mean for me financially, career-wise, in terms of my CV? How many months, how many months of a job gap can I afford in my CV so I can at least learn what I am desiring next? And also in the process, there's challenges like oh, I got an offer from Safaricom, but no, yes, it's machine learning engineer, but I need something that pays me at least the same or more than where I was. There's always going to be those challenges, but you just have to be disciplined after you've sat down and discussed and weighed what this means for me and if I'm actually okay with this. And along the way, friends and um, motivation comes in really handy. Because at some point, you, you like really have super lows, like any other normal human being. But because you signed up for that, you have to be strong until the process is done. I don't know if I've addressed that everything that you said, Anna, it was a bit long, but maybe you can. Yeah, I think you've, uh, you've, uh, you've addressed Okay. You've addressed most of it. I was just mainly concerned because, uh, okay, so for somebody like me, I've found myself thinking, okay, so I have rent, I have bills, mm -hmm. and uh, they can only afford four months of bills. So what happens after the fourth month if I still don't have that second job? Yeah, so I guess that you have to be mkikuyu. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, to be Kenyan a bit, you have to like know what you're you're going to lose you have to know like how i should cut down on my spending and you have to have like a plan b after four months and my spe spendings i mean sorry and my savings are all used up where will i go uh, i mean it, it's never going to be a smooth ride it can always be but be prepared for the worst okay okay okay, okay. that answers my question um I think we're done. It was Alexander, the last person. And um, do you want to wrap up? Okay, so maybe, uh, I don't know, Mohammed, uh, is, is it a question that has that, that you have to ask? Mohammed, maybe summarize it. Uh, it's, it's a short uh, question. What does the market offer in, in, in figures for the African machine learning and data scientists? Thank you. Uh, what is the market offer for machine learning, for an African machine learning? Yes, in figures, in numbers. As in money? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, that's dependent on a few things. Uh, mostly the company you always have to like go to indeed or glassdoor to see what they're offering and then i'll compare it to the market standards and if i may correct you maybe just don't um maybe next time don't say um for an african machine learning engineer not to take out the identity from you but um that that term already by itself is just like boxing you in some sort of shell that maybe you're used to thinking of. Just think of yourself as a machine learning researcher or engineer, period. And uh, I can't really give you a figure. You have to check for a particular company that you're looking for. For US, I know they offer up to $50 an hour in some in UK, maybe yearly, yearly mostly is 60K euros per year. So that comes down to, I don't know, 5K a month. And that in Kenyan shilling translates to about 700K a month. So I can't really answer that. You have to do the research for yourself. And okay. don't, go, don't mix up yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay. So... Can you say bye, Anna? Oh, okay, so thank you for that. I'm actually a noisy place. It just got noisy, the roads. 
I'm near the road, so I hope you can still hear me clearly. So I'd just like to say thank you to to Ada. You've been so inspirational, I can say. Maybe to me, I hope to the others, it's also been uh, very helpful. Maybe if you can get just like one thank you message from like uh, one of the trainees who is willing to go. And Annette, maybe you wanna speak up, Annette. Yeah, uh, I would like to be, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say very, uh, thank you. Uh, it's been very inspirational. I mean, I, I always find it very inspirational to hear from people uh, who passed what I uh, like, what I'm going through now, right now. So it's been inspirational, and keep uh, keep up the good work. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you for that internet, and uh, once again, thank you, thank you to Ada, thank you so much for sparing the last one and a half hours to be with us today. Yeah, I think with that, we can just wrap up, and then if you're still on the call, you can just stop the recording, and uh, we can go into the CBS session now. All right, uh, bye guys, you can always find me on LinkedIn or Twitter or anywhere really, you can just Google me, so... Nice talking to you and have a nice evening or afternoon, depending on your time zones. Bye.